Good morning. At the outset, I would like to thank DocPlexus for this opportunity. And it's a pleasure to be in the studio with them today. I'm going to attempt to talk to you about critically analyzing surgical options for benign prosthetic hyperplasia so as to facilitate clinical decision making and patient counseling. But before I do that, I think it would be worthwhile spending some time trying to understanding what is BPH and what would be the ideal time to operate. BPH has been a voyage of lifetime as far as I'm concerned. 44 years ago, I did my first open marine prostatectomy, that is 1973. Looking at the expanse of the entire spectrum of surgical technologies that I've been privileged to use, I still wonder are we there yet? I feel role of surgery, time of surgery, and the choice of surgeries we make are severely impacted and influenced by the understanding of anatomy and pathophysiology of benign prosthetic hyperplasia. 1856 onwards, Gray taught us prostate by lobes until McNeil in 1968 realized that it has a uniform cut surface, but Different parts behave differently. The cells are pre-encrypted. Embryologically, urethral buds develop into prostate. We are mainly interested in two pairs which derive from endoderm. Proximal is transition zone which encircles proximal urethra and the central zone encircles ejaculatory duct. The remaining three zones encapsulate both the earlier zones forming the peripheral zone. If you look at the cell structure, outer ducts have high mitotic activity, low secretions. Middle ducts have less mitosis, but high secretions. But we are most concerned about inner ducts, which have no mitosis, no secretions, but they're programmed for apoptosis, which is programmed cell death. Prosthetic adenoma, primary develops from transitional zone, which is of our interest. Its growth is regulated by programmed cell death, in other words, apoptosis. And this zone undergoes lots of age-related changes, which are in turn influenced by imbalance of growth factors and hormones, which continue changes as the man progresses through his decades of life. Mm. If you look at this particular picture, this is an open prostatectomy done 20 years ago, and one would like to have a fossa as open as that with beautiful flow. Unfortunately, it does not happen that way all the time, in spite of the fact that obstructive symptoms are prevalent and they can be taken care of. Most of the symptoms, which are storage symptoms, are bothersome. And by the time we start looking at the prostate, bothersome symptoms have already set in. What do we have to deal with prosthetic symptoms? As far as medical management is concerned, we have selective alpha blockers. They can be given on a long-term basis to manage the dynamic component of the obstruction. But when it comes to static component of the obstruction, we have five alpha reductase inhibitors, which deutasteride, but it has its own problems. There are a number of studies done which do say that it does reduce the incidence of prostate cancer, but when it happens, it's far more aggressive. Deutasteride, look at this, has an increased erectile dysfunction, five to nine percent, has a lower sexual desire, which changes the quality of life, indirectly causes stress. And unfortunately, in spite of stopping the medication, these changes continue to happen. Smooth muscle changes are because of hypertrophy of the smooth muscle, which doesn't hypertrophy, but undergoes collagen deposits. Age-related microvascular changes also cause ischemia, which increase collagen formation. So that reduces the compliance of the bladder 
these changes are irreversible. So it is important we should be able to offer surgery much earlier than these changes set in. This is a study which shows 87% of patients who came in for surgery has, have had medical management unsuccessful or failed. Flanagan, way back in 1988, showed that the longer you wait prior to surgery, the lesser improvement are going to be seen in the outcomes. And you must remember side effects continue, bladder changes continue. So I think we should be able to offer surgery much earlier than we, what we normally do. What do we do as far as open prostatectomy is concerned? Is there a role for open prostatectomy in 2017? Yes, there is. Bilateral fixed hips where you cannot be given a lithotomy position. The prostate is so large that in spite of a folded penis, you are able to reach just the apex of a prostate. I'm afraid you do not have much option but to offer open prostatectomy unless you have access to robotic interface and expertise to do it that way. Open prostatectomy was indeed a morbid operation with a lot of mortality way back in 1932. That's what initiated an alternative option as far as prostate management was concerned. Four independent inventions of different times were brought together in 1940. Transurethral approach to prostate was born. TURP is a very standardized step-by-step -step anti-grade resection of a prosthetic adenoma procedure. You can create a cavitation exactly the way you want it and take the entire adenoma out capsule to capsule and you have enough tissue seen there for histopathology. If you look at complications of TURP in 1889 to 1994, 1989 to 1994, you can understand they were mainly operative complications related to comorbidities, a lack of good anesthesia, lack of good medications. But a meta-analysis done in 1979 to 2006 very clearly showed that the complications were not of much concern. Transfusion rates had gone down, TUR syndrome was not seen anymore, bleeding was not a botheration. But look, if you look at this slide, there were three conditions which were not changing in spite of all the advances. Urethral stricture, hydrogenic stress incontinence, and bladder neck contractures. Why do they occur? They mainly occur because of discrepancy in the urethral lumen and the size of the instrument and the time that you spend within the urethra. They can be definitely managed by doing a otis urethrotomy, which prevents stress on the urethra, but still the numbers are very high. We cannot accept 11% urethral injury rate when the prostates are done. And the number of prostates done all over the world, this figure is too big to accept. And so we must have a change, an alternative to overcome these situations. The other reason why people are looking at alternative methods is look at these numbers. Even if we take 10% of the population above the age of 60, it's 41 million or say four crores at any given point of time. No wonder why instrument manufacturers, energy developers, pharmaceuticals are looking at something which will be beneficial to this large number. So we agree. Any new technology, energy, or procedure must be non-inferior to TURP outcomes, but at the same time, prevent complications related to urethra, maintain continence, and preserve sexual functions with long-term durable effects. I'm not going to talk about this. This is out. So let's, let's just read it once and say this doesn't exist anymore. What do we have now as far as Treatment op options are concerned. We have minimally invasive therapy. We have endoscopic transurethral surgery, open surgical procedures, which could be laparoscopic, robotic assisted, and investigational procedures, which are still on trial. Minimally invasive therapy either compresses prosthetic tissue or denudes the prosthetic tissue. Prosthetic stains have been used since late 80s but we are still waiting for an appropriate stent which will serve our purpose. We don't have a stent at the moment, 
which can replace a surgery for prostate. Transurethral microwave thermotherapy came in 1995. It became popular initially, but there have been a number of studies done which show the retreatment rate was as high as 30%. At the moment, we have a third generation of machine on trial, and we will only wait for the outcomes to tell us whether this is going to be there or not there. Transurethral needle ablation again came in 1995. A radioactive needle insertion into the prostate transurethrally, which cooked a certain area of the prostate, hoping that it necrotizes and contracts. There are three RCTs versus TURP retreatment rate 40% as compared to 8. Post operative infection 65% compared to 9. QMAX never improved more than 12% and volume reduction was only 18%. So again, this is not in use anymore. When we are talking about reducing the prosthetic volume, a Eurolift came in, FDA approval in 2013. This is compression of a prosthetic tissue done transurethrally. You have the pictures here, pre-operative and post-operative. Efficacy is better than the drugs and side effects are less than the TURP. It does only one good thing that it preserves the retrograde ejaculation, but otherwise it is behind when it comes to matching QMAX IPS score. We have two studies which have come up, 12 month follow-up shows 6.8% uh, uh, retreatment rate and two year follow-up shows nearly 14% retreatment rate. So we will have to wait for long-term efficacy of this treatment. So what is available to us today, we have transurethral resection of prostate, we have transurethral vaporization of prostate, we have transurethral enucleation of prostate, and of course, open lap and robotic prostatectomy. Let's go one by one to find out their efficacies and what the results are using uh, randomized controlled trials. If you look at this chart, resection has the highest experience, vaporization has the least experience. Vaporization has least learning curve. It's a very simple technique, whereas enucleation has the highest learning curve. Blood loss is not much of a concern. I just looked at the cost effectiveness from the Asian point of view. Resection is the cheapest. Enucleation is next. Vaporization is costliest. I recently attended AUA in Boston and their results are exactly the same. Even in the Western world, resection seems to be cheapest, enucleation uh, after that, and vaporization is costliest. We have number of energies, and resection can be done with monopolar, bipolar, diode, thulium. Enucleation can be done with the same energy, holmium added to it. Vaporization cannot be done with monopolar, but all energies can be used. There are a number of papers and RCTs available of different combination of all these, but I'm afraid they are all short-term um, results and they are not standardized and have that. Bipolar technique is something that is worth looking at. We were concerned about TUR syndrome when we did monopolar TURP. Bipolar uses normal saline, vision remains clear, can be used with pacemaker. Unfortunately, it does take a little longer time and we are not circumventing the main problem with urethra because we use the same instrument. The advantage of this is still with the same instrument and generator, one can enucleate, one can resect, and one can vaporize. These are the pictures of a post-operative prosthetic fossa showing the transrectal ultrasound images, how big the fossa and how good the fossa is. A major conceptual change that took place after 1940 was a transurethral enucleation for prostate with morcellation for histopathology. This came up from Australia, New Zealand, and this has changed the concept when we look at prosthetic resection. We now want to remove as much as possible. In fact, we want to mimic an open prostatectomy using enucleation technique. All energies can be used to this, do this method. There are a number of RCTs comparing HOLEP, which is Holmium enucleation of a prostate, with TURP, HOLEP with open prostatectomy, HOLEP with uh, green light vaporization, all of them totally agree that whole lip does remove more tissue 
than others. As far as open prostatectomy is concerned, tissue is more with open prostatectomy, but whole lip takes a shorter time, much shorter hospital stay. There are a number of other studies I can look at where they all agree that it does take a longer time, but tissue removed is much more than a standard TURP. These are the images of a post holep uh, fossa, which does look a little scarred because of the heat use, but uh, flow rates are beautiful. Tholmium is another energy which has been compared, which is very close to holmium, uh, standard to URP with resection and with enucleation. Tholmium is a much better cutting tool than actually an enucleation tool. We'll go to a couple of slides later to find out what is validated and what is not validated. Transurethral vaporization of a prostate was another technique which is used. Unfortunately, most of the studies that have been done have been done using 80 watts and 120 watts uh, machines, and they are not comparable efficacy-wise uh, to the standard HOLEP or of TURP. So we were not very enthusiastic about vaporization until we have now come to a different machine available. Look at this car. As far as energy is unconserved, there are different wavelengths. Green light is validated only for vaporization. Thulium is validated for resection as well as enucleation. Holmium is validated for uh, enucleation, whereas the new diode frequency is yet to be validated, but is being described and appears to be very encouraging. If you look at the level one evidence, MTURP and BUTURP with HOLEP has a very strong evidence that they are the best procedures. But eventually, what will decide which procedure is used is the potential disadvantages. MTURP still continues to have a little more morbidity as compared to others. BTURP uh, is better than that. HOLEP has a larger or a longer learning curve. And in vaporization, we lack histopathological evidence of what we have removed. If you look at this chart, HOLEP is better in all respects. But if you look at the same chart from a different angle, MTURP is still practiced all over the world in much larger number as compared to HOLEP. So HOLEP will have to catch up with the numbers with their studies. Vaporization has changed since we have got XPS 180 watt machine. There are two good studies which have come up and its efficacy is absolutely comparable as far as IPSS, QMAX, post void residue, prostate volume reduction is concerned. It appears to be superior to TURP when it comes to catheterization time, hospital stay, and time going back to work. We are looking very seriously at, at this particular thing. Going back to open prostatectomies, this is just not acceptable. If you look at two red squares, operative time and the blood loss, not acceptable at all. But if you do compare this to the robotic prosthetic surgery, I think this is evolving very well. This is a study which covers from 2008 to 2013. And we have a very good control as far as time is concerned. We have a very good control as far as bleeding is concerned. So I think one should be looking forward to robotic simple prostatectomy technique, which is transphysical first prostatectomy in due course of time. This is, again, back to the same slides, open prostatectomy done years ago, wonderful flow. And if there are no bladder changes set in by the time you did this, he would be the happiest person. It is surprising that there are only 26 recorded RCTs available which talk about sexual dysfunction. Because probably earlier it was this taken for granted that there's going to be a retrograde ejaculation with every prosthetic procedure one does. Uh, we talk about dysfunction in two respects. One is a, a, a erection difficulty and retrograde ejaculation. We are now talking about retrograde ejaculation. This has been taken up very seriously recently. And there are three studies which talk about preservation of a para and a supracollicular tissue proximal to Verumontanum. As far as TURP concerned, 
ejaculation preserving TURP, 89 patients, 90% reported preservation of ejaculation in a day under three months. HOLEP and vaporization doesn't seem to be that accurate as far as preservation of a paracollicular tissue is concerned, but they do also preserve ejaculation. This is the new concept that has come in the mind. Having done all this, are we really beyond the problem that we were looking at, like a urethral injury? No, we are still using the same kind of transurethral approach and we've not been able to overcome the urethral injury part of it. But none of these new study really talk about urethral injuries. I'm going to go a little further up and see what's in the sleeve, up the sleeve as far as prosthetic management is concerned. These are experimental things going on. They have not been tried on humans as yet. Uh, prosthetic artery embolization is a difficult procedure. This is done by interventional radiologists. The data that we already have tells us that unilateral embolization is good enough to cause reduction. Um, but finding the prosthetic artery is a very difficult task. And sometimes people have taken as much as three hours. We are waiting for human reports to come through. Botulium neurotoxin injected into the prostate is a, another concept which al paralyzes alpha receptors as well as causes reduction in the prosthetic volume, awaiting long-term results. Wave technology has already been used on humans. This is a technology where a drop of water is injected into the prostate and heated to 103 Celsius temperature, which expands 1,700 times, causing immediate cell rupture, reabsorption, and reduction in the volume. There are numbers I have just now heard in AUA, a two-year follow-up, which seems to be very, very uh, encouraging. But what is more important is acquiablation. This is robotically done procedure, a rectal ultrasound monitors the procedure and this high powered jet of water destroys the tissue, keeping the connective tissue intact and you create a cavitation in the prostate. This is also being used on humans. There are trials available. There is one year data produced at AUA recently and we will wait for further results as far as this procedure is concerned. So today, enucleation of prostate is more preferred, but it's a strong contender for TURP, but it will depend upon universal availability, widespread expertise, and cost effectiveness. We'll wait 180 watts vaporization to tell us the long-term results of five years. Till then, a TURP, whether monopolar or a bipolar, will continue to command the respect which it has done from 1940 till now. The future is very likely to be a robotic, retropubic, transcapsular, urethra-sparing, prosthetic adenomectomy, leaving intact bladder neck. This alone will take care of all complications of prostate surgery. Finally, I would like to end asking myself a question, what would I do with my prostate? My, if my prostate is 40 grams, I would prefer MTURP or a BTURP. If it is 100 grams, I would like an enucleation, either bipolar or a holmium. If it is 200 grams, I would like a Millins prostatectomy unless uh, I have an access to a robotic transvesical uh, prostate. Unfortunately, if I have a triple vessel disease with multiple comorbidities, I would prefer a 180 watt green light. Thank you very much for your cooperation and listening to me for the last half an hour. Thank you. Are there any questions? I've got the first question coming up. What should be the approach for a treatment of BPH in patients with prostate volume greater than 40 ml? Depending upon the expertise, a good resectionist, transurethral resection of a prostate can resect up to 80, 90 grams. So I would still say a TURP would be the ideal option for a BPH at 40, 40 grams prostate. Which patient should be referred for surgery in benign prostatic hyperplasia? I've just now described that no matter what you give, the changes in the bladder continue to occur because of stress and because of obstruction. 
and then if you operate at a later date you might not get results as you want and you might have to then supplement them with um, anticholinergic so if you have proved that it is an obstructive LUTs offer surgery much earlier can a prostate be malignant how it can be further treated uh, whether it's malignant or not malignant is the clinical assessment a doctor has to do a proper rectal examination and see it the next thing is going to be a PSA assessment which is necessary and PSA with a rectal examination will decide whether he goes in for a transrectal uh, ultrasound guided biopsy to define whether he has a malignancy or no. And if he has a malignancy, we are entirely into different way of thinking and we'll manage it that way. Uh, I'm afraid I'm not going to be talking about malignancy of the prostate today. Is preservation of sexual function possible when Relieving benign prostatic obstruction surgically, yes, it has been proved for the last three years. Number of studies have come up which tell us that if you preserve paracolic, uh, paracollicular tissue in front of the verumontanum and the side of the verumontanum, you can preserve um, ejaculation. What is hormonal treatment in BPH and malignancy? The hormonal treatment in BPH is dutasteride which is alpha 5 alpha reductase inhibitor uh, which acts on the prostate and prevents its further growth it has a limited action but it does have a long term side effects when you give it on a long term basis it does not act very quickly you need to give it for 6 months or more and for malignancy it's entirely different it's a total androgen blockade which will constitute either giving uh, injections or taking uh, doing a minor surgery um, which is called orchiectomy uh, or, or maintaining them on um, further medical management what are the benefits risks and side effects of holmium laser enucleation of prostate uh, benefits are yes you do remove a good you do a good adenomectomy uh, side effects there is a definitely far more congestion um, uh, of the prostate transient initial uh, incontinence is there but holmium is a very standardized technique now for management of benign hyperplasia of prostate what are the key recommendations of current evidence-based guidelines for the management of BPH key recommendations are obstructive LUTs Approved, go ahead and offer them surgery in the guidelines in the Western world holmium is at the top of the list followed by bipolar transurethral resection followed by vaporization which treatment should be recommended in moderate to severe benign prostatic hyperplasia I have just said this a good resectionist can resect up to 1900 grams but beyond 100 grams holmium uh, enucleation of the prostate would be appropriate how important is the use of prostatic specific antigen test in case of diagnosis and treatment of prostatic hyperplasia it is very important to rule out a malignancy in the prostate by the way does PSA does rise with the size of the prostate we know but that's a, there's a limitation PSA does rise with infection we know but we have to look at that also and PSA does rise uh, with um, malignancy so it is very essential to do a PSA estimation diagnose it adequately accurately but malignancy will be only confirmed on biopsy how to manage hematuria in BPH patients uh, if it is a hematuria prior to surgery it possibly could be a simple volume of the prostate which is stretching one of the vessels the patient may be on anticoagulants um, given by the cardiac um, physicians and so that has to be looked into hematuria could be secondary to infection as well post-operatively if there is a hematuria that bothers you I think finasteride has been a drug used for a long time to control post-operative hematuria of course having ruled out other causes of hematuria what are the operative outcomes and surgeon preferences for non-polar versus bipolar transurethral resection of prostate? 
Bipolar resection of a prostate is definitely more preferred because if we do it with saline, there are no chances of uh, TUR syndrome. Bipolar is a better option if it comes to TURP. What clinical evaluation should be considered to rule out other conditions in men with benign prostatic hyperplasia? LUTS is a terminology which has been used, which is low urinary tract symptoms. And if I have to show you a slide on that, there are n number of central causes, local causes are responsible for LUTS. Prostate hyperplasia being one of them. So one has to really evaluate the situation of LUTS in, from all angles to come to a final conclusion that this is because of an obstructive prostate and then a treatment should be offered. What is the normal duration required to regain urinary continence after prostatectomy operation? Patient should ideally be continent on the day one. They may have transient incontinence for a couple of hours or a couple of days, but I don't think anything more than two or three days is acceptable. Which diagnostic tests must be considered in case of patients in high risk for BPH? Uh, I, I do not understand the question, what is a high risk for BPH? Uh, the high risk is from the surgical, per, the anesthetic point of view, and everything possible has to be taken care of, including a cardiac opinion, a 2D echo, management of diabetes, management of hypertension, management of urinary infection before you take a patient for a prostate surgery. What are the major setbacks of early detection of BPH? Well, we were always considering not to operate on BPH when the patient is around 40s and 50s with an intention of preserving his sexual function, preserving his retrograde ejaculation, uh, which he might lose when you do the prostatectomy. But now with the latest studies, yes, we can do a ejaculation preserving prostatectomy. And if we have enough evidence that even at that age, a prosthetic is obstructing and causing changes into the bladder, I think we will offer them surgery. How to manage hematuria in BPH patients? I have talked about it just now. Look at the fact that there is no um, infection, preinfection. infection Make sure that he's not anti on anticoagulants. Stop them with the permission of a cardiologist. And that's how you will be able to manage. But most important is you've got to investigate and make sure that there is no other cause of hematuria, like a papilloma in the bladder or a TCC in the bladder or in the upper tract. What lifestyle changes do you recommend to prevent BPH? Well, we all understand BPH is a age-related process, which is a benign enlargement of a prostate. We've discussed that this happens because of changes that happen in the uh, aged patient as he crosses the decades of life. This is related to growth factors. This is related to um, estrogen appearing on the scene. This is related to um, DXT coming up there. So these are the natural processes that happen. I don't think we can prevent it happening. But we also know that everybody who has a BPH does not need surgery. There are people with 100 gram prostate void well and have no symptoms. And there are people with uh, 30 gram prostate which are obstructed. So uh, there is nothing that I can tell you which will prevent a BPH. Should we go for pharmacological management or surgical interventions for early diagnosis of BPH? You can try pharmacological management if it is mainly a dynamic component which is bothering the patient because that can be treated with alpha blockers. But if you have a static component, do not give dutasteride or any management for a longer period of time because you are setting changes in the bladder which are irreversible. And then afterwards, when you operate, we might have to then treat with anticholinergic drugs to take care of the um, compliance of the bladder. So proved. Obstructive LUTs offer surgery earlier. That's what I would recommend. Mm, anything else? No. Thank you very much. Thank you for your lovely questions. 
I hope I have been able to answer most of your queries and questions. If there are any, please do write. We will be able to answer the questions. As regards presentation, if there are any queries and questions, do come back to me and I will answer them. Thank you very much once again.